anyone not in the know, the Kirby series appears to be tied with the likes of Yoshi for Nintendo's most innocuous and lighthearted franchise ever. However, if you ask a diehard fan or do any kind of digging on the internet, you'll find a great cave offensive's worth of unexpected secrets. I think it's generally accepted that Kirby games tend to be roughly 95% cute and cuddly, and 5% eldritch horror. That's in large part due to the true final bosses a casual player might not even see, especially in these earlier games where a genuinely terrifying villain that yields the good ending upon its defeat is locked behind collecting a certain number of special artifacts. This is a defining trait of the games directed by Shinichi Shimomura. He was in charge of the distinctive trio many refer to as the Dark Matter Trilogy. Kirby's Dream Land 2, 3, and Kirby 64 The Crystal Shards. This spiritual trilogy shares many elements, including an overarching story for the antagonist, whose very existence has had a ripple star effect for the many non-Shimomura games to come. This is the story of these three games, the birth of Dark Matter, and all the other eerie slash shocking secrets hidden within. Let's first talk about the second Dreamland game, which is tamer than its successors but still a notable entry, serving as the debut of this aforementioned world eater. The plot, as provided by the instruction booklet, is simple and basically repeated in both sequels, albeit with increasingly raised stakes. Dark Matter is this bleak, inexplicable cosmic force that stamps out positivity and infects the minds of innocents wherever it goes. So Kirby's sugar-coated home planet Popstar is a popular place for it to try and conquer. In this game, we're restoring the Rainbow Islands, an archipelago in the country of Dreamland, to its former glory, before the namesake rainbows were stolen by our villain. After making his way through every locale and clearing every level in the final world, Dark Castle, Kirby can finally face off against Dreamland's self-proclaimed king, who's currently under the influence of Dark Matter. King Dedede's defeat calls for a standard credits roll, unless Kirby possesses all of the rainbow drops necessary to forge the apparent bane of Dark Matter. The Rainbow Sword's appearance causes the Cosmic Corruptor to leave the pudgy penguin's body, and ascend into space for a galactic showdown. This is almost exactly what happens at the end of Kirby's Dreamland 3. Just sub out rainbow drops for heart stars. Also, Dark Matter separating from DDD looks cool in Dreamland 2, but that's our only visual indication he was even possessed. In 3, likely because of the major graphical upgrade, Dark Matter uses DDD's body in all kinds of disturbing ways directly clashing with the cutesy, hand-drawn pastel style. He lifelessly floats around the screen, puppeted by the extraterrestrial entity as his stomach opens up to reveal teeth that try to chomp Kirby like a demonic Pac-Man. Its other attack involves the signature eye emerging from DDD's belly as it shoots out globs of itself. After Kirby forces the darkness from his body, the Heart Stars, if they're all gathered of course, will merge to create the Love Love Stick. That name probably sounds better in Japanese. This magic wand may even be more powerful than the Rainbow Sword, as it allows us to not only confront and defeat Dark Matter again, but bring about its creator this time. A godlike being simply called Zero. This World Eater, with a pulsating red eye, sends out smaller Dark Matters to fight Kirby, but more notably its own blood, straight from the iris and the surrounding tissue, which grossly expands and retracts. The fact that Zero attacks with its own blood through tears and tears reminds me of the Hemolacria item from The Binding of Isaac based on a rare, real-world medical condition that causes people to cry tears partially composed of blood. The battle is fought inside of the Hyperzone, a strange, void-like place consisting of a stormy blue background, with nothing but black clouds rapidly rushing by. Black tendrils have been able to reach out from the inside before Kirby severed them in an attempt to completely consume Popstar. 
A single, aforementioned, menacing red eye stares out from its center, greeting any players who received the bad ending by not properly purging this ultimate threat. If Kirby does successfully take him on, towards the end of the fateful encounter, Zero will, as a last resort, execute what is probably the goriest maneuver ever depicted in a first-part Nintendo game. Seriously, after being weakened enough, Zero's red eyeball will burst and hemorrhage from the socket to chase Kirby until it explodes in blood. How can it get any worse than that? Well, Zero 2 is the big bad of Kirby 64. As far as what Zero 2 is and where it comes from, I think there's enough evidence here to support the implication that this is Zero Reborn in one way or another. The red feathered wings sprouted from its sides and the halo above its head seem to suggest that this is the angelic wrath of Zero's spirit. But I believe it's more than just a vengeful apparition because maybe Kirby never fully vanquished it. Kind of like beheading a vampire but not properly burning the body. I think that the Red Eye, what many assume to be the core of Zero, is able to be reborn within the husk that Kirby left behind. Zero probably knew this, so it sent out its eye as both a last stand and a distraction while it reformed itself in the time between these games. That giant bandage then could very well be covering up the still healing wound from where its first eyeball was ejected. The old Zero died, and this new one is using its reanimated body. Whichever theory you subscribe to, the fight is undeniably unsettling on its own. Instead of a black and blue backdrop, we get an intense black and red, evoking strong gigas vibes. Gigas being the final boss of Earthbound, another game by HAL Laboratory that already references Kirby and vice versa. Zero Two doesn't attack with its own bloody tears this time, but it does bleed out profusely when Kirby and Ribbon shoot its eye with crystals. If this doesn't seem like blood to you, by the way, then take a look at this artwork from the True Credits, where this sketch of Zero Two clearly sheds a single tear of it as confirmation. These games have also been noted by the ESRB to have animated blood in them. We sort of dove right into the final encounters because there wasn't much else to talk about with the Dreamland games, but this is certainly not the case for the Crystal Shards. Before we totally move on from the second dimension though, there is one more oddity I'd like to point out. In Kirby's Dreamland 3, these bashful creatures known as Batamon have a tendency to hide out in areas inaccessible to Kirby. The creepiest thing about them though is that there's no explanation as to what they are and why they look like our hero. They're an undefined anomaly, seemingly existing only to pose questions without answers. There is a single room in the game where Kirby is actually able to fully interact with one of them, but swallowing the doppelganger yields nothing but disappointment. Are Batamon supposed to be the same species of Kirby, just like Meta Knight's implied to be? Are they clones of Kirby, and or made of the same stuff as dark matter like Gooey? The world may never know. Moving along to the N64 again, let's now check in on our possessed friend Adeline the artist whose paintings can somehow come to life. I laughed when I first saw that one of her drawings is purposely censored. I like to think that whatever this is, it's so incomprehensibly scary that it's been blurred to preserve our sanity. One Wikipedia contributor's take on it is that this monster is censorship itself, which is genius. The game's fifth world, Shiver Star, is where these dark aspects really ramp up though as the planet is heavily implied to be an apocalyptic Earth, perhaps following a nuclear winter. Shiver Star looks strikingly like our own globe frozen over, complete with seven continents and a single orbiting moon. According to an archived page covering the game on Nintendo of Japan's official website, all of the people who originally called Shiver Star their home had to abandon it because of the intense, uninhabitable cold. As further evidence it was humans who once lived here, the planet is familiarly industrialized with a shopping mall and factory for Kirby to explore. 
These buildings have been deserted, save for the monsters that have taken over, but they're still being maintained by automated equipment and robots that outlasted their creators. And the disturbing connotations don't end there, because I haven't even talked about the factory's purpose. In general, as a platformer, it's always nice when the platforms you're bouncing and bounding from have some sort of context and make sense within the world established instead of, you know, just floating there for no reason. With this in mind, a manufacturing plant is the perfect level for a designer, because they can utilize conveyor belts, cranes, forming presses, and other miscellaneous machinery to act as both methods of traversal and stage hazards for the player. It's ideal when these background elements also work together to tell a visual story, which is what I think is happening here. As the deeper Kirby delves into this production site, the more set pieces appear that may help explain the foreboding music. In one room of the factory, there are giant test tubes housing different creatures inside liquid. The pipes interconnected with circulating fans and pumps all seem like steps to one big processing system. And at the center of it all is a huge, non-specific mechanism that looks like the invention of a mad scientist. As you can probably guess where I'm going with this, I feel like there's an insinuation that for some unknown reason, some serious animal experimentation has taken root here. The practice of encapsulating these poor souls and then leaving them behind is inhumane. But what if the original goal was for their health and benefit? Honestly, I believe that the harshness of the assembly lines that precede this room, along with the overall sinister feeling of the place, paint another picture entirely. The lava chamber and the generator room situated next to this main hub make it difficult to discern the fate of these entrapped critters. But I think it's safe to say that the intent was nefarious. Was there a plan to roboticize them all, like the various victims we'll see in Kirby Planet Robobot? One important observation to make is this robed humanoid subject in the very last of the tubes that looks sort of like the witch enemy, Kiki. So were these organisms captured from somewhere else? Or are they creations, maybe replicas, being preserved? What if humans were initially responsible for the outbreak of monsters on Shiverstar before Dark Matter arrived? There are so many possibilities, so I'd love to hear your own theories in the comments, but this is all speculation. So no matter what you believe went down behind these walls, these mysterious four are now unfortunately and indefinitely trapped in this disconcerting factory. The last point about humans in the world of Kirby I want to address brings us back to Adeline slash Adam. Yes, I do think of them as the same character as they're really the only human the series has ever depicted. We know it was likely humans that fled Shiverstar, so is Adeline one of those survivors? I love all the breadcrumbs these games have left us, as the thought that Kirby may take place in the distant future of our own universe is beyond cool. All things considered though, it might just be a good thing that Kirby doesn't coexist with the lot of us, if we're going by his marketing depictions, mainly western advertisements, that have promoted the very games I've been talking about today. I'll be providing a link in the description to some of these over-the-top commercials, where Kirby storms a bar, devours people he doesn't like, and blows up a kitten named Muffin with a missile. That's all I had this time for the dark aspects of Kirby. Let me know if you'd like me to cover another set of games centered around the pink puffball, or something else entirely. I do plan on covering a certain recently released Zelda game for Dark Aspects sometime soon, so please look out for that. Anyway, thank you all for watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed this video, and please give me your best theories on the factory. I'll try and respond to each and every comment. See you next time.